Now we're into the cell. Okay, all that chemistry we learned hopefully will come into play somewhere in here in those macromolecules, right? We started with subatomic particles. We got that over with. We're good there. Then we have the atoms, chon. I think we're solid. <clears throat> and all the ions and acids and bases. Got to know this stuff. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the molecules, of course, the bigger molecules, the macromolecules that are organic. Carbohydrates, polar. Proteins, polar. Lipids, nonpolar. And your nucleic acids, which are a little bit different. But now we're putting all that together in organelles into the cell. And then we'll move on to tissue when we do uh, integument. And we should be doing that in lab soon too, I think tomorrow. Okay, so the membrane, what do we talk about here? Well, let's talk a little about the cell first. The membrane is just intense. So the membrane okay. is the outer part of the cell and the nucleus is generally in the middle. So everything in between is called the cytoplasm. And we'll talk about all those organelles that are in part of the cytoplasm. So the cell is the smallest living part of life. This is living, this is life, not like a subatomic particle. So each individual cell or cell type, and we put it into tissue groups. Remember the four tissue types, the muscle, connective tissue, nervous tissue, and epithelial tissue, all basically have similar cells functioning together, but it's trillions of these things if you put them all together in the body. So their functions mirror their shape. So the anatomy is mirroring, mirroring the physiology. So we move on to tissues, you'll see that more. So we're gonna look at cells and all the organelles and the cell membrane, 250 different types of cells, not that much, but if you put them all together, it's our whole body cells. So it depends on what's in the cell or what the function of the cell, what it needs to have. Like a, a muscle cell, you remember muscle cells? You've heard of muscle cells, right? Like skeletal muscle cell. You need a lot of mitochondria So that's one of the organelles, one of my favorites, because it makes ATP, energy for muscle contraction, because these muscles do a lot of work. And it's not just skeletal muscle, it's smooth muscle as well. And of course, the you know, cardiac muscle, like happy Valentine's Day muscle, All right? So we'll talk about <clears throat> those different organelles. Now, epithelial cells line things and they secrete things. Blood cells don't have a nucleus, it's part of connective tissue. Fibroblasts, also part of connective tissue. So there's all different shapes and sizes. Your adipose cell is a fat cell which stores triglycerides. It's part of connective tissue. Then you have a white blood cell type guys that have immune processes like the big eater called the macrophage. Really good mirroring structure and function. This is a neuron. We're gonna live here in the neuron later on nervous tissue, <clears throat> it's very specialized. And then these are reproductive cells like the sperm and ovary and the female sperm and the male fem female has the, um, sorry, I said ovary, I meant oocyte. So we'll see the different cellular parts of it. So the outer part is a plasma membrane. And this is not just a cell wall. It's not just a boundary. It is a boundary. It keeps things inside and outside like a prison, but not that tight. This is very, selectively permeable. So that's the function, basically. Permeability means allowing things in and out, like sodium, like glucose, sometimes a lipid soluble thing like testosterone, oxygen, water, carbon dioxide, amino acids, all different things that the plasma membrane is very picky about when and how things should go either in or go out. So the nucleus, very important. This is like the government of the cell. This is the DNA. Have you heard of that? Deoxyribose nucleic acid. It's a nucleic acid. But listen to this. The, the DNA never leaves the cell. 
DNA. And this is the stuff, this gets handed down from, I don't know, forever, from generation to generation. This is what our species is about, moving that DNA to the next generation. And it never leaves your cells. So that little bit of DNA, no, it's not a little bit, it's a lot of bit of DNA that's in a sperm cell. And then there's DNA in a oocyte. You know how this works on a Friday night, the sperm swims up that fallopian tube and penetrates the oocyte and forms one cell with a double nucleus, so to speak. And then the DNA moves on to another cell and another cell in your whole body until you bring it down to another generation. But know this, the DNA never leaves the nucleus. So the nucleus is, is the, the main brain of the cell. And the nucleus, uh, a red blood cell, Just I just need to say this over and over. A red blood cell is a nuclear. It doesn't have a nucleus. A nuclear. If you see an A in front of something, it usually mean that, means that it's not there. Make sense? It has to. All right. So DNA, and you have proteins, things called chromatin, which you'll see. So everything between the plasma membrane and the nucleus, like this is a plasma membrane of a cell. This is the nucleus and has a little dot inside called the nucleolus. So everything in between is the cytoplasm. So it's not just the organelles, but also the fluid. So yeah, you have like mitochondria. You can have um, rough endoplasmic reticulum, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, ribosomes. You could have lysosomes, centrosomes, all these organelles. But the fluid inside is called cytosol. So cytosol is intracellular fluid. Intra means within. Inter means between. Get that right. Intracellular fluid. So we're mostly water, I told you that. So cytosol, also known as intracellular fluid. So everything outside the cell, not everything, just the fluid outside the cell is called the extracellular fluid. You gotta know those compartments, cytosol, extracellular fluid. And then you put a blood vessel in there. Well, that was cool how that happened. I'm gonna get that thing back. If you put the cytoplasm back in there, or I'm sorry, if you put the Cytosol, um, blood vessel, I'm sorry, plasma up in here. And it's another fluid compartment. So things come out of the blood into the ECF and then maybe into the cell. Okay, so I lost that slide. <laughs> that was about plasma membrane. So that's about selective permeability and boundary and protection, all that stuff. So the plasma membrane, let's make this a little bigger. The outer portion, here's the nucleus, right here, all of this. And this is the nucleolus. So let, let's get the nucleolus right out of the way. The nucleolus builds ribosomes. And I might've mentioned that the ribosomes are the site of protein synthesis. So the nucleus, a uh, nucleolus, sorry, builds ribosomes. And there's ribosomes, there should be ribosomes here, like ribosomes are part of the, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And there's free ribosomes throughout the cytoplasm and the cytosol. So <clears throat> ribosomes function again is to build proteins. Nucleolus makes ribosomes, but ribosomes is the site of protein synthesis. Remember that, it's always important. So the nucleus contains what's called chromatin. And the chromatin is DNA plus proteins like histones. So you can't really see the chromosomes in here, but before they get dense and right before they undergo mitosis, like we talked about in the lab, this inner part of the nucleus is all filled with chromatin, which is DNA. Remember, DNA never leaves the nucleus. 
And you know what? The nucleus has its own membrane and it's called the nuclear envelope. And there's little holes, little grommets right here. And that, those are called nuclear pores. So the nuclear pores are the exiting holes for things like ribosomes that are made from the nucleolus. And <clears throat> there's another nucleic acid called RNA, like messenger RNA to be exact. And messenger RNA makes a copy of the DNA, which is called transcription, and takes these, this template from DNA, the, the actual set of programmed amino acid building codons and takes it out through the nuclear pore. So RNA, messenger RNA leaves the DNA, goes to the ribosome to build proteins. And remember from chemistry, what are the building blocks of proteins? Amino acids. Amino acids. So, so that's really what DNA, it's all it really does. It's crazy. It, it just sets messenger RNA up with this architecture to go out and make amino acids. And if you put amino acids together on the ribosome, you're building polypeptides. And if you get more than 50 amino acids, you got yourself a protein. And what are proteins? They're a structure. They're, a, they're in our membrane, you're gonna see. They're enzymes, carriers for glucose, channels for sodium, crazy stuff. So then right outside the nuclear membrane is another membranous structure. And that's called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Now the RER, why is it rough? What is it studded with? It's embedded with ribosomes. So if I ask you, what the hell does a rough endoplasmic reticulum make? Well, you're gonna say, well, it's rough because it has ribosomes. And he told me ribosomes are the site of protein synthesis. So we're making proteins. We're taking amino acids from messenger RNA and we're building proteins in the rough ER. I wouldn't kid you about that, okay? Now somewhere here's the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Another membranous structure. Now this structure, <clears throat> tube-like membranous organelle does not make proteins because it's smooth. That's what it's smooth because it doesn't have ribosomes. So we're making other things, important things. We're putting together phospholipids. I mentioned that, right? That's what the cell membrane is made of, phospholipids, really important. It's making steroids, it's making glycoproteins, mixing uh, carbohydrates and protein for cell structure. It's just not making straight up amino acid filled proteins. It's putting together glycoproteins, but it's not making the proteins. What else? Carbohydrates it could be making, other lipids, but it's not straight up making proteins. That happens in the rough and the plasma reticulum and out at the free ribosomes. Cool. So there's another membranous structure and that's called the Golgi complex or Golgi apparatus. Okay, and what it was, it's the post office of the cell, right? So that apparatus will take everything that's being made, whether it's proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, steroids, phospholipids, and it packages them into nice tidy vesicles. So like a post office, it'll send it out to be delivered. Sometimes the vesicle will, will kind of merge. Look at this, it'll merge with the membrane and the vesicle has a membrane of its own. So the membrane and the vesicle kind of fuse and it lets things out like I told you this last time, this exocytosis, which could be a neurotransmitter, like serotonin, like acetylcholine, dopamine. So it's gonna release the, whatever's in there. It could be something else, but I like to talk about neurotransmitters because you're gonna learn about the nervous system a lot this semester. So this is exocytosis. It's spitting the stuff out, All right? You'll also learn about endocytosis, which is, a form of, or phagocytosis is a form of that. And we look at different cells that, that where that's important, very important. Peroxisome is like a detoxifying vesicle. And you can find this a lot in, in the liver because the liver has to detoxify things like alcohol, or if you take a Tylenol, or if there's something in your body that uh, due to metabolism that shouldn't be there, it doesn't jive with the rest of your system. Peroxisome is there to, to kind of swallow it up and, 
and break it down into something more um, amiable to your system, like hydrogen peroxide or something like that. So that's detox. When you think peroxisome, think detoxification. Then you got this other crazy thing. Look at this thing. It's called lysosome. Now, lysosome, I like to call the suicide sac of the cell. Because we talked about phagocytosis. We talked about how it's the opposite of exocytosis, where these vesicles could, or the cell membrane could engulf something, like open up, take in like a, let's say COVID, right? COVID virus or bacteria, it looks like strep or something like that. It'll engulf it. And that's called phagocytosis. Bring it into the cell, then it'll be in a, its own spaceship. And then the lysosome comes along and destroys it because lysosome has high digestive enzymes, like it even has HCL in it to destroy. So that's why I call it the suicide sac. That's like, a, I guess it's like the garbage man or recycling guy of the locale of the cell, suicide sac, right? Centrosome, centrosome makes these things called centrioles. Centrioles are tubular proteins, and these are gonna be important in uh, somatic cell division, which is called uh, for mitosis. So it's mitosis is the process of somatic cell division where the cell actually splits. Remember in lab, we talked about the cell starts out as one cell, somatic cell, not a sperm or egg, that's meiosis. So mitosis, every other cell nucleus is actually duplicating and forming two identical cells from one. So the centrioles keep the integrity of the chromosomes and the integrity of the cell as it's dividing. Remember PMAT, especially you really see that in, in the anaphase, you see like the polar part and the spindle starting to form. So this all happens from the centrosome matrix and the centrioles are the actual tubular proteins. Exciting. Okay, so now the mitochondria, that's again, probably, probably my favorite, Emily. I think that might be my favorite because this is where most of the ATP is made in the presence of oxygen, like aerobic respiration, especially in something like a muscle cell, highly fatigable. So if it is something, if, if you have a lot of mitochondria in, in certain areas of the body, which we'll learn in muscle tissue, like say your quadriceps, they're built for more endurance. Your postural muscles are built for more endurance. So there's more mitochondria there. So they're less fatigable. And those fibers are a little different. So we'll talk about that when we get to muscle, about how much mitochondria we have, because you need a lot of oxygen to keep contracting muscles because you need to make ATP over and over and over. What about the heart? The heart, like I told you, skeletal muscle in your quadriceps, you can rest those, buy now, pay later, like a credit card. But in the heart muscle, it's cash only. You have to use that ATP constantly to keep that thing beaten. Right, and AMP2, we'll talk about that. Anything else fun on this picture? There's chromatin, it's up there. So there's a good list of organelles. There's a whole PowerPoint on organelles and talk about it in, in, in lab too, as you saw. Extracellular material. So this is what's found outside the cell. You really can't talk about the cell membrane until you talk about those fluid compartments. So substances that are outside the cell and that's called interstitial fluid also known as extracellular fluid. Interstitial means inter, is between tissue. Stitial means tissue. So that extracellular ECF fluids. And that's between cells, right? Then blood plasma is not in the cell. That's extracellular. That's a whole nother fluid compartment like I showed you. Cerebrospinal fluid, we're gonna talk about that. CSF that's around the cells which make up the nervous system like neurons and neural glial cells and nervous tissue. Neurons are the functional cell, neural glial cells are the supportive cells of the nervous system. So the cerebrospinal fluid acts as a protection, a cushioning actually, which is one of the um, functions of water, if you remember. Okay, so cellular secretions into cavities or into ducts, like your exocrine stuff, like your salivary fluid, which has enzymes for digestion, especially for carbohydrate, mucus, which helps move things along tubes and lumens in the 
reproductive or digestive system and also in the um, respiratory. You're gonna hear of a, a cell called goblet cell. Goblet cell, let's get a little foreshadowing to epithelial tissue. A goblet cell is an epithelial tissue and a goblet cell is what secretes mucin or mucus. So you see your goblet cell, think of mucin, which is a precursor to mucus, which is a fluid, much more viscous. We also talked about serous fluid and that's less viscous. And that's more within the, um, the cavities between organs. So that, that's something that you should take with you for lab. So when you move on, you should, as we go into different systems, it's important to know the difference between serous and mucus fluid. Sure. Uh, intracellular fluid, remember that intra is the cytosol. So that's inside the membrane, plasma membrane. So it's a mobile, this is a, if you really look at it, it's a fluid, I should look, write this fluid mosaic. So it has all these parts and different structures within it. And it's mobile, it's moving, it's not static. It's not a cell, this is not like a plant cell wall. This is a very mobile, active, changing in position membrane. That's what they call it, fluid mosaic, right? So the extracellular fluid, I think we know by now is outside the cell. Pearson is very repetitive, which I like. So the, what's the function of it? It is selectively permeable. I think in the old days, we used to say semi-permeable, which means that sometimes it's permeable, sometimes it's not. Dynamic fluid, right? Cellular activity, what leaves the cell and what enters the cell and it's controlled. So you could just call it the cell membrane. Once you get friends with it and you know it well, you can just call it the cell membrane. But to get to know what it is, this is fluid mosaic model. And what's it really made of? The main part of it is what's called the bi phospho lipid layer, which means like the inside and outside are kind of similar because they have phosphates and then lipid tails. Like a balloon with two strings, right? I'm gonna see this before. And then this is the inside membrane and this goes on and on throughout the outer membrane. So this would be like, say, the cytosol. You should know what that means now. Inside. And outside would be the ECF or the interstitial fluid. So the phosphate face, the outside and inside, and that's polar. The middle is your lipids, and that's nonpolar. And I think I mentioned to you that most of the membrane or the membrane is mostly nonpolar, hydrophobic. Understood? So we'll see a lot of that as we go. So membrane lipids, it's a lipid layer. And like I said, it's mostly lipid. And then we're going to talk about all the proteins that are embedded. And it floats through this fluid membrane and constantly changing patterns, which is what makes it fluid and a mosaic. Hey, look at this mosaic, fluid mosaic like from Maria. So there's pieces, different structures and shape and different macromolecules that are within the membrane. The surface has a bit of carbohydrate, like they have, this is where this glycoproteins come in. So it's like a sticky outside, not sure why. It's kind of sticky the outside. It's not just to connect cells together. So we're still working on what that is. It has some identification processes, but glycocalyx is a sugary coat, sugary coat, sticky, sugary coat. Okay. So cell junctions are different. Cell junctions could be proteins that hold the cells together. And, and some cells, like, like you're going to learn a lot about the neuron. Like, like epithelial tissue has a basement membrane and the cells are 
pretty much packed together like this if you look at them from the side. So they're connected to each other by junctions and they have weird names like desmosome adherence junctions. Some junctions are tighter than others. Like in the bladder, you want a nice tight junction. In the blood brain barrier, you want a nice tight junction between cells. So it's extremely important that things don't get through in or out. But like a cell, like a, like a neuron, like this is the end of a neuron, kind of looks like a knob. And then you get another neuron or maybe even a muscle cell on the other side. There's a gap junction. So they're not even touching. And that's the ones I like to talk about the most because that's part of muscle and nerve tissue. So that's really important. Got it? Good. So here's the plasma membrane in a picture of it actually, segment of it. And you can see the biphospholipid layer. These are uh, carbohydrate actually attached to the protein. So, and this little yellow in here, that's actually cholesterol. And these blue things, now Maria uh, Pearson uses proteins in blue. So some proteins go through the whole membrane, some are just peripheral, meaning it could be inside or on the outside periphery. Some are gonna be channels, like you see, like you could fit like something in there, or carriers that carry things in, carrier channels, all working through things like active transport, diffusion, and osmosis is, is pretty unique with because that has to do with the diffusion of water. So that's kind of important. Anybody have any questions so far? Am I putting you to sleep, Anthony? I'm so sorry. I'd be asleep too. Everybody okay? Yes, everything yep. good. Everything okay. sounds great. Good, good. Give me one minute. I just got to send an exam out. I'll be right back, okay? So let's try to talk a little bit so you have something to hear on the recording for that minute. Make some jokes. Anthony, tell us, tell us some jokes while I'm gone for a minute.
Thank you, guys. Let's get back to work. So here it is again. Now, why do we need cholesterol in our cellular membranes? And that's really for support and flexibility. So you need a homeostatic amount of cholesterol in your blood. I know we worry about high cholesterol. And sometimes the medications that are given like statins to stop the enzyme that produces cholesterol in your liver would actually affect the membrane and you'd have side effects if this cholesterol was destroyed. So here it is. Let's get a closer look so we can see the lipid tails. So the phosphates, here's the ECF. All right, the cytosol is down here. So remember that inner and outside. And if you remember what I said, that the inside of the membrane is usually has more of a negative charge, especially if it's an excitable membrane like muscle or nerve, and the outside is more positive. So that gives you a polarity, especially in a resting state. And the outside is very positive because there's so much sodium in the ECF, sodium everywhere. There's also chloride, but not as much. Potassium stays inside the cell. That's where that lives most of the time. The concentration of potassium is higher inside than it is outside, believe it or not. So if you look at the tails, that makes up a lot of the membrane. And this is what makes it more hydrophobic, more nonpolar. But the polar heads add that polarity. In fact, the polar heads set up a nice little aquaporins, which are pathways for water to come in even though it's polar, obviously it's polar. That's the first thing you say with water. So let's take another look a little bit closer at what's there. So this explains the, the phospholipids, the polar phosphate, the nonpolar tails. And it's a bilayer. So they're kind of facing each other towards the middle and the phosphates face the outer and inner. Cholesterol, again, that adds to the the lipid portion, which makes it more hydrophobic uh, overall. So, you know, if you have extra cholesterol in your membranes, if you have high blood cholesterol, not necessarily. Okay, but cholesterol is important, uh, not only for the membrane, but also it's the precursor to all of your steroids and steroids are lipids, remember, steroids are lipids. You can't take that for granted. So these are all different proteins. And this is probably the thing we should talk about the most is the proteins that are either embedded or peripheral, integral or peripheral, right? And you have these carbohydrates. Again, this is, forms that sugary coat. This is what a carbohydrate looks like, those carbon rings. And one of the things you should know, I probably won't talk about this much until we talk about immunity, but these they call them glycoproteins when a lipid is, uh, protein is mixed with the carbohydrate. They can act as identifiers. Like you've heard of things like tissue transplant, right? And like if you get like a kidney from somebody else, your body is gonna reject that tissue. Like unless it's from maybe, maybe if it's from your identical twin, right? Then it would be Okay, but your body's gonna pick up new tissue as non-self. So this is what gives you yourself. It's not DNA. It's not, well, it's transcribed. The proteins transcribed from DNA, but the carbohydrate is done that way. So it's not a fingerprint. It's just an identifying marker that's pretty much unique to you. Kind of understand that? Cool. Any questions so far about that? So you have your proteins and this looks like a protein channel. So the proteins remember are polar. So if something that is polar like glucose needs to get in, it could use a protein to get in, but that would be more of a carrier. So proteins could be carriers, they could be channels, they could be enzymes, which are usually protein, or well, they could be receptors for something like a polar hormone, like insulin. 
So those proteins that are embedded are really important. So here it is, kind of breaking it down into how much, 75% phospholipids, two parts, hydrophilic, phosphate heads and hydrophobic, very repetitive, it's good, it's good. A little bit of glycolipids, which on the outer surface, just like the glycoproteins, we don't really talk much about that, but it does make that sugary glycocalyx. It's a pretty big number when you think about it, 20% is cholesterol, so which really makes the membrane more of a non-polar lipid than a polar phosphate. Like you didn't get enough of this, you could see the close-up of the polar heads and the non-polar tails. Usually this is one saturated fatty acid and one mono unsaturated fatty acid. So this is kind of a, a schematic, but vesicles are kind of like this. They have those membranes. Same, it's actually part of the membrane. So here's the cytosol and here's the ECF. It easily shows you. Of course, it's not that simple. It's so fluid, it's so mosaic. So you have two different types of proteins and proteins have more density than lipids, believe it or not, definitely more density than water. So integral proteins will go through the membrane. Peripheral protein will be on the inside or on the outside. And then your author writes them in purple. Okay, so integral is firmly inserted into the membrane, or we call it transmembrane. That's a good word, transmembrane through it. And they have both. It's not just hydrophilic, it has hydrophobic regions. So the hydrophobic areas interact easier with lipids and hydrophilic more with water. Makes sense, hydrophilic, hydrophobic. And here's the proteins that could be the channels or carriers. So channels usually are for ions like sodium, calcium, potassium, and chloride. It's the only negative anion, that negative ion I'm showing you, which is called an anion. These are all cations, positively charged, sodium, calcium, potassium. Chloride is an anion, negative ion. Carriers are usually for bigger things. And you could have diffusion that needs a carrier, like glucose is relatively large, so it needs a carrier to get into the cell. So there's carriers that are proteins on the membrane, transmembrane protein through the membrane. Enzymes like ATPase, like those ATPase pumps that pump sodium outside the cell against this gradient and potassium back inside against its gradient. So you need ATP to move things against its gradient because that's active transport. That costs you something. So the enzyme could be ATPase and other enzymes that catalyze reactions within and within cells. Receptors are really cool because they're specific for whatever ligand that they need to interact with, like a receptor for acetylcholine. A receptor for acetylcholine is a protein on the muscle membrane. So acetylcholine can bind with that receptor and then that opens up the sodium channels and let's in sodium, then we get what's called depolarization. Important stuff, this membrane, it comes back. That's why I wanna keep pressing it into you. Peripheral proteins, kind of similar, except they're not um, carriers or channels. So they could be enzymes or motor proteins that change the shape during certain cellular reactions like mitosis or muscle contraction, like muscle is all protein. You're gonna see there's really not much else to talk about and the structure and contraction of muscle. So it has, its shape is very important. Its strength is very important. Its contraction is very important, which is just shortening. And those peripheral proteins all can act as connections, junctions really, cellular junctions. Not the gap junction, of course. Cellular junctions are junctions like that. And you're gonna hear terms like uh, desmosome or hemidesmosome. Just some foreshadowing for later, because these words are kind of weird. Adherence junction. So it's not the sticky part of the cell that forms the junctions and the connections, it's really proteins. And they kind of tie the cells together too, at times. So sometimes you need really tight junctions, sometimes you need loose junctions. 
And then of course there's gap junctions that don't have any real connection. Sometimes they have channels in between like little pipes that connect the two cells, but usually gap junctions are pretty free and open. So the tasks, so this is really important, the physiology of what's going on here. So of course, transport proteins like um, ion channels, then you have receptors and you should get this whole receptor thing down now before we get to it. Receptors are specific for the chemicals like a hormone or neurotransmitter, that's the ligand. So the receptor is like, a, is like the block of the lock and key and the key would be the ligand. So something's gonna happen when that receptor binds. It usually opens up a channel for sodium, to tell you the truth. Because sodium coming from outside the cell to the inside of the cell causes an excitation and depolarization, which is really important. So it changes the signal of transmission. Enzymes built into the membrane, like ATPase. And here's more cell recognition. We're not really talk a lot about that, but, but that's really important for things like um, tissue transplant or something that's going to be able to, to handle um, the um, immune response. So it's kind of like a fingerprint. This is a close up of the transport. Now, why do we need ATP here? Because probably this is an active transport, like taking sodium out of the cell, which takes energy because you're going against the gradient, right? So there could be these pumps that pump like the sodium potassium ATPase pump, which pumps like three sodium out and then two potassium in, All right? Does that make sense? Any questions on that? So it just needs ATP to push it out. Not to um, yeah, that, that's pretty well said. Yeah, because think of going uphill and like sodium going against its gradients, like pushing your car up a hill. So the energy that you put into pushing the car would be kind of like ATP. So yeah, yeah, because it takes energy to do that. So it'll never happen or happen really, really slowly. So the enzyme decreases all the energy needed for that and makes the reaction happen faster or the movement happen faster. Like diffusion, simple diffusion, just goes through the membrane, like oxygen and carbon dioxide going the other way, hopefully. Right, CO2 gases, very lipid soluble, these two. But something big like glucose, even though you have high glucose in the ECF, like say if you have high blood glucose, glucose is kind of big, so you need uh, facilitated diffusion. And it's facilitated by a carrier within within a channel usually. So this is they call it a carrier, which is a protein, especially for something hydrophilic like glucose. So yeah, you're kind of pushing things up. Here's a nice animation you could watch that shows it. This is called, um, again, I'm, I'm kind of going ahead because I want to kind of make this seem like this is going somewhere. And that's why you just have to remember all the physiology here. But these are proteins that are receptors. So receptors mostly are proteins. And remember what I said about proteins, they have to be transcribed and built, transcribed from your DNA to amino acids, which the amino acids are built or the amino acids are brought to the ribosome when you build proteins. So it's very genetic how these receptors are built. And sometimes it, the genes for building receptors is either expressed or suppressed, depending on the state of the body. So these are constantly in flux, that's my point, these proteins. So they could change. And they could be a target, like you've heard of like autoimmune conditions, right? Anybody hear of autoimmune conditions? where your body actually um, attacks itself, like your immune system will attack its own cells. So a lot of times they're attacking these receptors. And if the receptors are destroyed, even, I mean, of course they're not all gonna be destroyed, but if most of the receptors are destroyed, then you might not be able to use these hormones, like acetylcholine. Like when acetylcholine binds to its receptor on a muscle membrane, 
it allows for muscle contraction. You're going to learn that in great detail. So that's why I talk about it now. So imagine if you had a condition that destroyed your acetylcholine receptors on your muscle membranes. That would be really hard to get muscle contraction. So there's a condition actually called um, myasthenia gravis. Might as well talk about it now. It's also called MG. It's not MS. MS is multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune condition against nerve tissue. This is a purely muscle attack from your own T cells. So you can't bind the acetylcholine if the receptor is not there. And it could be genetic too, but most of the time it's straight up autoimmune. So you're going to have weakness in your legs. Your eyes are going to droop. It's kind of a mess, right? It's kind of a mess. More animations showing the receptor complex. Ligand gated. Might as well take a look at that and learn it now because we're going to repeat that pretty extensively when we do muscle. And then nerve. Muscle is first. Enzymes are built right in to the cell membrane. Not all membranes have the same enzymes, of course. Okay, so this kind of speeds up whatever the cell's function is. And enzymes catalyze, right, by lowering the energy of activation. So always remember that. It doesn't stop these animations. I should, I should just play these and have a cup of tea. Cell recognition is where these glycoproteins come in what makes yourself self, your tissue is yours. So unless you have an identical twin who has very similar glycocalyx and glycoproteins on every one of their cells, your body's gonna reject that. So we call this the MHC actually. I, I, you don't have to remember this, but just to see what this is. And this is called major histo compatibility. complex. And I want you to know what these words mean. That's why I'm bringing it up. Major, we all know what that means. Major. And then histo means tissue. Compatibility means, is this compatible with all of my tissue? Is other tissue compatible with my tissue? So this is what makes your cells your own, not a fingerprint, not even DNA. So it's part of the glycocalyx, which are glycoproteins, which is kind of important. I don't know if we know that much about this. So if you receive tissue from somebody else, your body knows it's not your MHC. So it treats it like it's an antigen, which is a foreign substance in your body and, and, and starts an immune response. So if you ever received a heart transplant or a kidney transplant or liver transplant, you'd have to take immunosuppressive drugs and this is really why. And, and of course, you'd have to take anti-inflammation medications like cortisone to stop the immune response. That's what anti-inflammatory or anti-immune is. More animations, it's like going to the movies. This is more attachment. I'm not gonna get too deep into this, the way cells attach, but it's proteins. It's not the sticky stuff. Cytoskeleton is a word you have to know. Cytoskeleton, because that's the inside proteins, the strands or microtubule proteins that give the cell its shape. So the cytoskeleton, we have to revisit and talk about the proteins that make up the inner shape of the cell, like kind of like a frame of a house, you know, when they put up the studs of two by fours and you have that protein structure of the cell. Functional, we don't really know. We don't really know. It's, it's function right now is, is just to build a shape. So again, cell to cell joining. We're not gonna get too much into that. Okay, glycocalyx, I think we're there. Non-self versus self. That major histocompatibility complex. So that's important. Um, this is pretty much talking about what I'm saying um, about immune response. Like in the case of something that comes in like cancer cells, which is a definite antigen right? So cancer cells, and, and cancer cells are very tricky. And, and so it's so, sort of like, so same thing that what COVID would do to your, your T cells. Cancer cells will come in and, and 
and they don't come in from the outside. They're mutated within your own body. So cancer cells have the same glycocalyx as all of your cells. You follow me? So cancer cells are your cells, just that they're immature. They're going through way too much mitosis and they're taking up space and they're causing destruction of tissue. So our immune system thinks it's part of your body. So it doesn't, it doesn't really um, destroy it on its own. So sometimes when people, again, this is depressing, but people who get in chemotherapy or radiation, sometimes they take strong immune or anti-immune medications to stop the immune system from proliferating and making more cancer cells, especially in something like leukemia. So cancer cells, they masquerade as our regular cells and they really can take over. That's how spread happens. And your immune system is like tricked into thinking that cancer cells are normal and they just keep proliferating. So that's kind of important when it comes to immunity, but we're still learning cells here. Let's not get crazy. So this is different types of junctions. You have tight junctions like in the, the bladder or in the blood brain barrier in your, between the blood vessels and the brain tissue like neurons, desmosomes, which is basically between epithelial tissue and the gap junctions. These are the ones we'll talk about a lot like in between two neurons, two nerve cells or between a nerve cell and a muscle cell. Those are gaps. So tight junctions are important. Where do you think you would see those? That's your impermeable, really. Like in the bladder, like the urinary bladder, maybe the uterus, right? Because we don't want those acids leaking out, or the stomach especially. Stomach is one place you don't want acid leaking out into the peritoneum, into the abdominal cavity. And you see the connections there. And we're going to do epithelial tissue. I think we'll talk more about junctions when we do the tissues. I think that makes more sense. But you see, sometimes they're tied together through beads of proteins, not the sticky glycocalyx. Desmosomes, like rivets, like little, um, kind of like nuts and bolts, like putting things together, the zippers. So they're placky proteins or button like protein, keratin, right in the skin. Right, anchoring, or it's like this. Right, so this is important in the epithelial tissue of the skin. Makes sense. It shows the desmosomes. You, you, we won't have to do this now. I just want to get through this cell junctions, gap junctions. Sometimes they have like little pipes between called connexons, so ions can flow directly without the ECF between two cells in the gap junction. So ions flying through small molecules like neurotransmitters between cells, like acetylcholine, right? Or norepinephrine, which are neurotransmitters, serotonin. So these are gap junctions with connexons. Not all gap junctions have connexons. Connexons are little pipes between gap junctions. Okay. How are we doing guys? Okay, girls, nurses, Others, Anthony's, all the Anthony's doing all right? I'm good. Valerie, good. Valerie, Nurse Natalia, how you doing? You okay? I just finished the chemistry test right before class, so it's kind of- You're burnt out, You're burnt out man. I, I'm trying not to talk about chemistry, I promise. <laughs> no, I know. I'll just mention it once in a while, if you don't mind. Okay, I'll be right back. I gotta check on that test, so take a breather for less than a minute. How was everyone's weekend? No. It went too fast, man. It went too fast. Snow is going to give you a day off if you have school tomorrow. That's, except if you have to sit here at 8, 6.30 tomorrow night with me. Yeah. I want to go in. I'm going to be... I know. Good night, Val. Yeah, 
I'm so sorry. I promise I'll, I'll, I'll tell good stories in the, in the Zoom session. Can I come in next week? You are coming next week. No, next week. Now I'm group E. Oh, no, you can't. You can't. It's COVID, man. Okay, but who, who's going to snitch? You? Come on. Come on now. Let me in. <laughs> I need to like, practice on microscopes. It's for my future. It, you're right. You're right. I'll work it out. Don't worry, my friend. I'll work it out for you. I'll be, let's see. Who's in that group? I don't know. I have to look. I'll be Chelsea. Chelsea's in the, the other No. Group. Chelsea, I'm taking your spot. <laughs> now, can we get back to class, please? <laughs> yeah, let's get out of here. Come on, let's move. Okay. So back to the cell membrane, man. I'll keep the chemistry low. So you have passive transport. That doesn't cost anything. That's free. That's diffusion. Diffusion is always passive. Remember that. All right. And remember the membrane is selectively permeable. Active transport requires ATP. That costs something. So active costs, passive does not. Diffusion is part of passive. And osmosis is passive. Osmosis is the diffusion of water. Okay, so active transport is moving something against this gradient, going from low concentration to high concentration. So let's go through these, and this is why we learned all this stuff. Simple diffusion is like oxygen, carbon dioxide. They don't need a carrier. They don't need facilitation. Walk right in the membrane, right into the oxygen, right into the mitochondria, carbon dioxide out of the cell and back into the blood and into the lungs to be blown off. Facilitated diffusion, one of the most important forms of facilitated diffusion is glucose transport. It's relatively large, but it's still diffusing from high concentration to low concentration. And osmosis is the diffusion of water towards the solute from high concentration of water to low concentration of water. Okay, so it's always get this concentration gradient down now. Okay, I'm gonna have to talk about it again because you know it. So moving down a concentration is like the car rolling down the hill. Down, moving up is like pushing the car up the hill, which makes you have to give energy. Like somebody said before, <coughs> moving something against or moving something up, pushing something up actually. So, you know, all molecules have movement. Life is part of movement. Even the subatomic particles are always in motion, right? And energy in motion is called kinesis or kinetic energy. So these are all colliding, right? The, all these molecules are colliding and that kind of creates a, an energy as well. So the scattering depends on the size of the air, uh, of the, the cell really. We're talking about cells and the size of the compartments. So the extracellular fluid is a huge compartment compared to the intracellular fluid. So this is a, a kind of an experiment of diffusion where you'd put like a, a, a dye or like an Easter egg dye or whatever we use that can diffuse into water. So over time, you know, you add time to this. And this is without an enzyme, you know, add time and eventually that, like even a tea bag which has a membrane will actually disperse and become homogenous over time. Now an enzyme will catalyze that. Increasing the temperature of the water will catalyze the time it takes for that solute. Now the dye is the solute, the water is the solvent to disperse from a low concentration of the water to a higher concentration. I'm sorry, from a high concentration to a lower concentration of solute in the water. So that's diffusion, low concentration to high, con uh, sorry, from high concentration to low concentration, down its gradient. Okay, so the speed depends on three factors. One is how much, you know, how much T is in that bag, the size. So the smaller molecules will diffuse faster because they move more, they collide more. So this, this is kind of inverse. Smaller the molecule, the faster, we're talking about speed of diffusion, higher the temperature, which makes sense when you're you know, making a cup of tea. 
and it diffuses into the hotter water, hot water. So it's faster to make hot tea than it is to make iced tea, if you ever tried that. So temperature is probably the most important thing. And homeostatic temperature in the body. So equilibrium is kind of an isotonic situation. Isotonic, we'll call it isotonic. Let's get used to that word. Iso means same. So there's an equilibrium between Really, we're talking about the cell membrane here. Let's not kid around. We're talking about a nice isotonic um, ECF and cytosol, which forms a nice balance and tone to the cell, to the membrane, and even to blood vessels. That's a really important fact. Okay. So natural down concentration gradient is easier. So things will come in in higher concentrations on the outside to lower concentration on the inside. A nonpolar hydrophobic uh, membrane stop diffusion of polar things. That's why, again, differentially permeable, semi-permeable, selectively permeable, based on the polarity of the membrane and, and the polarity of the substances that are coming in. Okay. So molecules, they're able to passively diffuse through the membrane. And that's simple diffusion, like oxygen, carbon dioxide, right? Technically, water is unique. So that doesn't really diffuse through the membrane. It has aquaporins. It has a special quality that's built just for water over time, evolution, right? So larger things or polar molecules like glucose pass through through diffusion, but it's facilitated diffusion. Osmosis is an example of facilitated diffusion. So water comes in through these pores called aquaporins. Throw that word at you too. And really that it's what happens here is like, you, know, you have the membrane here. I'm not gonna draw the whole thing. But then kind of the membrane will kind of shift. And these are phospholipids I'm drawing here. And they'll form like a little channel. So water, again, then I'll go back to the membrane here. So water could actually come in through these aquaporins and come out based on osmotic pressure. So if this is the ECF, and this is the cytosol. You know, the, the water can come in based on its concentration gradient. So if there's, if inside of the cell has high in solute, then water will follow the sodium, the chloride. If it's high on the outside, water will leave the cytosol and go into the ECF. Like if you go to Popeyes, right? You, you, you eat a lot of salty stuff. So the salt, you know, gets into your blood, into your plasma. It kind of floods the ECF with sodium and chloride. So what happens is the, the fluid, the water inside the cell comes out towards the sodium. So you get kind of swollen in between your tissues, right? You ever see that? Like sometimes they call that edema. It's, it's not true edema, but it, it does get puffy, right? And if you have a problem with your balance, it can be true edema, which is a condition that could start at your heart too. Then the opposite would be something like dehydration too. If your blood plasma gets low in water, then it's gonna be high in sodium and the solute is gonna go up. So the water is gonna go into the blood plasma and it's gonna dehydrate your cells, which is why you get sick when you're dehydrated because the, your, your body doesn't care about the cells as much as it does the blood. So osmotic pressure between the blood, between the cells in the blood the ECF and the cytosol is very important, the fluid compartments. That's why I keep mentioning that. Okay. So if the plasma membrane is damaged, then we have, you know, then there's a problem. They'll diffuse too freely. So burn patients, that's a good example. If you have a burn you, and you start to lose fluid from your cell, especially a third degree burn, you know, the, the fluids will come out due to osmosis, right? So it's one of the things you gotta, you gotta know about this whole tonicity, these proteins, right? I keep saying protein, 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 but you need protein inside your blood, right? 
because that helps maintain that osmotic pressure. So let's say you, you have damage in your kidneys and you're, you're losing proteins in your urine. You should never lose proteins in your urine. There should never be protein in your urine because that means you're losing it from your cells coming out of the blood. So that's going to create a lot of problems in the intercell intracellular compartments and intercellular compartments. That's another reason for edema, which could be a sign of kidney failure. So kidneys kind of control that fluid volume in your, in your blood, right? And then it affects your ECF. So burns is kind of another example of that. Precious fluids, it says. And water is a precious fluid for sure, especially the blood plasma. Okay, back to simple diffusion. Nonpolar lipid soluble substances diffuse directly through. They did say that already, and there it is. An example is O2. Remember, oxygen is a molecule. Carbon dioxide, very lipid soluble. Did I mention steroid hormones? You know, testosterone walks right in. Estrogen, come right in. No charge. Fatty acids pretty much come right in. Yeah, unless they're attached to something that's polar. Some small things such as water can pass. So there is some, some free pass, but remember the aquaparents. Back to the movies. You can watch this on your own time. Got a lot to do here. Okay, so lipid soluble substances like say, let's say this is oxygen. O2, that's the best one because that's the one we're gonna talk about the most. Right in, no carrier, no protein necessary. Simply diffusion, not facilitated diffusion, which would involve a carrier, even though it's still diffusion and it's free and it's passive. Don't forget that, please. That's the main thing. So facilitated diffusion, certain hydrophobic molecules. Um, this is wrong. Sorry, but your book is wrong here. That should be hydrophilic. It should be lipophobic. Let's put lipophobic. Lipophobic. Maybe that'll help you understand them more. You follow me on that one? That happens. You know, I make mistakes. The book makes mistakes. Happens all the time. So the glucose is polar. Amino acids are polar. They're hydrophilic, right? So they're a little bit bigger. And ions, ions are a little bit different. Ions are usually voltage-gated channels, but they do respond to concentration gradients. So we like diffusion is free, passive. I'm gonna write this the right way so I don't make a mistake. Going from high to low concentrations. I like to write concentration in a box like that. That means concentration, right, Christine? I mean, uh, Natalia, you just took chemistry, you know what that means. So you have carrier mediated facilitated diffusion. It's still free, it's still passive, passive, no ATP. This is the really what you take away from this. So it's still diffusion, even though it's facilitated. So they bind to protein carriers and the carrier takes them in more or less. Then you have channel mediated diffusion for these are more for ions in either direction, mind you, inside or outside the cell. And a lot of times they're voltage gated. You're gonna hear this term voltage gated when we get to nerve tissue after the, a couple of other topics like muscle. Yeah. So water filled channels would be more hydrophilic or lipophobic. Sorry about that. Passive membrane transport, again, carrier mediated facilitated diffusion. Still says diffusion, it's still passive. It still requires no ATP, free of charge, gratis, pro bono, All right? So carriers, of course, have to be transmembrane. They have to cover the whole length of the membrane. And they're transporting specific polar molecules. This is right, such as uh, carbohydrates like glucose, amino acids, or something that's too large. So that's basically what we're talking about. So moving things across the membrane Binding, this is really important. Let's talk about this. This is, if you really want to know your stuff, talk to me about this. So binding is limited by the number of carriers present. So carriers can get saturated 
when all molecules are bound and are busy transporting. What the hell does that mean? It's, it's kind of like when the train is too full and we can't take out any more passengers. So where are you left? At the train station. Are you following me? Valerie, are you with me? Nurse Natalia? So let's go, let's go back to, um, let's go back to uh, Chick-fil-A. Okay, well, I'm gonna have a uh, chocolate shake at Chick-fil-A every Thursday, except for tomorrow, right? So what happens is, and obviously the, the milkshake has a lot, it has got fat in it, but it's got a lot of sugar. Everybody agree? A lot of sucrose. So sucrose is broken down to uh, glucose and um, fructose. So glucose is what we need to get into our cells, right? So we're going to have very high glucose. You've heard of something like high blood sugar, right? So once you get down into the kidneys, the kidneys are going to filter all your blood. You have five quarts of blood in your body. Every bit of that blood has to go through the kidneys and be filtered out and then maybe reabsorbed. So your blood is full of glucose, all right? Because I'm eating it when you milkshake, drinking milkshakes all the time. So once your blood glucose is high, we have to try to get it into the, back into the blood. Like the cells of the kidneys do this. This is a perfect example, which unfortunately you're not learning the kidney, but think of any cell who's taking glucose into it and bringing it back into the body as opposed to peeing it out. So glucose is kind of big. Now answer me this, now this is where I hope you're at. Is glucose polar or non-polar? Anybody? Fats are nonpolar. So glucose is a carbohydrate. So it's polar. Right? So it, it's, and it's in high concentration because, again, I'm stuffing my face with milkshake. So my blood glucose is high. So the concentration is very high in my blood. So we need to get that glucose either into the cells or get it out. So there's a certain finite number of carriers that will take the glucose into the cells. So you run out of those. And what's gonna to happen to all the glucose if you run out of carriers like the train to bring it into the cell? What's it gonna do? It's gonna stay in the blood. And glucose in, in the blood is not a good thing to have hyperglycemia or, or high blood glucose levels because it's damaging. It's gonna damage the kidneys. And, and possibly if I keep going to well, it doesn't, Chick-fil-A is not all that bad, but if I, if I keep drinking that milkshake, I'm going to become diabetic type two because now insulin is going to be all screwed up, not knowing what to do with all that excess glucose. I will pee some of it out and you will see that in my urine, but now I'm going to start to, maybe my vision is going to be impaired. It's going to affect my cardiovascular system as far as coronary vessels because there's only a finite number of carriers that are produced to get the glucose through facilitated diffusion, high concentration to low concentration. So that's a pretty good example. I hope you remember that shit. We'll see. All right. So where are we? So that's what saturation means. It's too, there's only a finite number of carriers and then they're saturated. No, all aboard, no way. Can't get more people in there. So here it is. Well, look at this. This might be the glucose. You know, it's a carrier and it's diffusion. Diffusion costs nothing. Please get that down. It's passive. High concentration to low concentration. But, and there's only a finite number of these. So what's left? The glucose will stay in the ECF and it's got no place else to go but back in the blood. So look at these words. These words mess with you. Like this says lipid insoluble. Lipid insoluble, that means it's hydrophilic. Water soluble, it's the opposite. So watch that terminology. And make you learn this shit. Okay, so now you have channel mediated diffusion. Again, what are we saying? We're saying diffusion. It's passive, it's free, no ATP. It's passive, it's free, no ATP. All right, just made that up. So Channels could be aqueous filled, which is hydrophilic, of course, and they're transmembrane proteins. So they're ion channels, or could be water channels like aquaporin. So this, again, this, here's the word aquaporin, and that's for water. 
where you have that polar channel, water filled, hydrophilic, phosphates on the outside. Phosphates are polar, so they love water, they're hydrophilic. I can't repeat this enough. So they have leakage channels, and this is really important for neuro. You have leak channels where like the sodium will leak in because the concentration is so high on, on the outside of the cell. Potassium could leak out, and that happens more common, more often, where potassium will leak out of the cell because potassium mainly is on the inside of the cell. Let me say this again. Sodium tends to leak in a bit because its concentration is always higher outside the cell. Potassium tends to leak out because its concentration is so high inside the cell. And that's more common, potassium leaking out. You gotta remember that for, for later. Gated channels, and these could be gated by different things like voltage. And this is really important for nerve tissue as well because you have that polarity that becomes depolarized and then it opens the channels. You could have ligand gated channels. Remember the acetylcholine, remember the receptor? So ligand would be the acetylcholine or the insulin, whatever the chemical messenger is. And the receptor is a receptor for that ligand. So that has, that's a gated channel. So when the ligand binds to its receptor, it opens up a channel for say sodium to come in and that depolarizes things. You could have mechanically gated channels in the nervous system. Nerve tissue is really, I keep talking about nerve and muscle because that's where you're gonna live this semester. Mechanically gated means if you have certain pressure, like uh, it, you know, if, you, if you put pressure on your skin, it creates a sensation of pressure. Or if you have vibration into your ear, it has a mechanically gated um, receptors that open gates for depolarization. Because once the sodium comes inside, that all hell breaks loose. And I will explain that a lot when we get there, but I need you to kind of start thinking about it because nervous tissue is very difficult. But if you know that, you're pretty good, right? So this is channel mediated. So for the sake of argument, let's just use sodium. Like as if this was a leak channel. So look at the concentration of sodium on the outside. It's higher on the ECF than it is on the intracellular fluid or cytosol. So it tends to leak in, in this case. And it doesn't just have to be sodium. It could be other um, molecules, usually small, small molecules though, with these kind of channels. And remember these channels are protein, trans uh, protein or transmembrane proteins. Live it, love it, right? Osmosis, okay, just very repetitive, I love this. It's movement of a solvent, really. Solvent is really the, the water, which is an abundance in the solution across a semi membrane a permeable membrane. Diffusion, guess what? It's free, no ATP necessary, right? So through a lipid barrier, even though water is polar, it's unique. Look at this, look at your author. This is a science book saying it could sneak past the nonpolar phospholipid, sneak past. Wow, that's pretty good. Like sneaking into that huge line at Chick-fil-A on the way home at nine o'clock at night from lab. But we have these aquaporins and I drew that beautiful diagram before. So look back in the recording. It's probably gonna wind up at the Guggenheim by Saturday, that beautiful drawing. Okay, so flow occurs when water is in two different sides of the membrane. So I talk about these um, compartments, fluid compartments, they all have membranes. Like the blood has a membrane, the blood vessels have a membrane and the cell has a membrane and there's compartments in between because that's gonna come up a lot in a &P. Crazy. Here's an aquaporin and it's protein, right? Protein and it could be also the phosphate, it's hydrophilic. So there are multiple types of aquaporins, like in the kidney, you had a bunch of aquaporins. So this is more like a kidney aquaporin. The one I showed you before, the one that's going in the Guggenheim, that's in most cells. And look at the bunny ears, right? The or teddy bear. You got the oxygen and the two hydrogens. Don't forget about polar and nonpolar covalent bonding. Don't forget about hydrogen bonding. Don't let that get past you. Okay, because we have tests, right? Next week, I got to put these kind of questions on. You're gonna do great. So diffusion of water. Osmolarity, 
right? Osmolarity, we kind of talked about that, right? A little bit. And concentration, total number, solute power fuels. So this is like the concentration gradient. I'm not going to mention osmolarity or osmolality too often. It's kind of mentioned in chemistry though, but it kind of, it kind of has to do with the concentration of whatever we're talking about. Because moles is like a lot of one substance. So that adds to the concentration, just like the rate of diffusion is increased by its molarity, the molality, and it's basically the same thing. It depends on what medium you're talking about. So now we're getting into some equilibrium here, how the concentration on the inside of the cell matches the outside and creates a nice isotonic situation. Okay, so we're getting into more osmosis. Let's get to the end of this and we'll take a break. So again, this U-tube with a, with a membrane starts out with a higher concentration on this side of the solute. But then as the time goes on, that's really that's what happens in time, that this will form this equilibrium on both sides because of the rate of osmosis and rate of diffusion in this U-tube, right? And if I put a stopper here, like say I put a stopper right there, There'd be a lot of pressure against that membrane too. So it builds up a, a, mem uh, a pressure and a tone, you know, this, this movement of water towards the solute. So water always moves towards the solute, like, like the dog on a leash. I might've mentioned the chemistry part where the solute is usually in our bodies, it's usually like sodium or chloride that's so high in the ECF. So solute is the smaller amount like sodium chloride or sugar could be like monosaccharides. So again, the osmolarities between the membrane. So we want to reach equilibrium and form this isotonicity. I keep getting at this isotonicity. That's going to be the important thing. With the same concentrations on both sides, right? And volume changes, depends on where the solute is and where the solution is or the solvent is. So one side to the other, the membrane. So again, same thing. Now this changes things as you add more water or you increase on one side. So it'll go towards, again, the water is going towards the solute, right? It's going this way. So it's going to go up the tube if I don't put a stopper there. There's no pressure. There's no exertion against that water. So water is going towards the little pink dots. So as a movement, and that movement is osmosis. Hydrostatic pressure is built on this. This is basically how your blood pressure works going into the tissue, right? Because, you know, again, it's hard to talk about this because you're not going to do um, cardiovascular. But you could picture, you know, that big pumpy thing in, in your chest, right? It's called the, the heart. It's got a left ventricle that pumps blood heavy pressure into hard pressure into the arteries. And the arteries are very high pressure and that creates pressure into the tissues, and that's hydrostatic pressure, really, is the, because water, the blood is mostly water. So that puts pressure into the vessels. And osmotic pressure is about the water around, or what's in the extracellular fluid, or what's in the cell, depending on where it's going. So the solutes, like sodium, usually, I keep saying sodium, or, or large proteins, too, inside the cell, can draw water towards that. And that results in a pressure against the membrane and the pressure is against the membrane. So these forces kind of counteract each other between the movement of water and the movement of, let's say, arteries and veins, the blood through that area. So that's where we're going with this, right? This is a very complicated um, to uh, topic when you talk about capillaries and where things are moving and diffusing in and out all the time, especially fluids. So there's kind of like an, an equalizing of pressure between blood really is what we're, where we're getting at here. The pressure inside the vessel versus the pressure outside the vessel. And it has something to do with your blood pressure, right? You talk about high blood pressure, right? Let's talk about this for a minute. So I try to make this make sense to you. Everybody heard of hypertension. You okay there, Jeremiah? You, you heard of high blood pressure, right? Hypertension. Some of you guys are nurses and gals are nurses, right? We're going to be nurses. So, High blood pressure could be from a couple of things. Number one, the biggest cause of increased blood pressure is, is constriction of the blood vessels. 
The second thing is way too much volume in the blood vessels. That means too much water. You follow me? Like the, the larger the amount of fluid in your blood, the higher your blood pressure is going to be, right? So that creates uh, a tension in the vessel in between the ECF and the blood. So all of that is pretty much based on osmosis. And what's, what's inside the blood vessels? It's not just water. It's your red blood cell, your which is carrying oxygen, has no nucleus, your white blood cell for immunity and your platelets for, um, for clotting. So that blood pressure could actually affect what's going on inside the cells because they're fluid compartments as well. So you wanna have this, you wanna have what's called an isotonic solution between the cell, like a red blood cell. I can't draw a nucleus because it doesn't have one, all right? So this is, a let's just say, and it really is like this. This is like seven micrometer red blood cell that has a beautiful shape. I drew this perfect. This is gonna wind up in the, definitely in the Whitney by Sunday, this beautiful circle. So the, there's fluid inside the cell and there's fluid outside the cell, right? And if you have a nice balance of pressure, osmosis in both directions, including the hydrostatic pressure from the blood vessels, you're gonna have what's called a nice isotonic solution. So the solution is isotonic with the inside of the cell. The solution's out here, right? That's, the, that's pretty much the plasma of the blood. And then you have the cytosol inside the cell. So it has a beautiful shape, all right? If you have too much, like say salt outside the cell, what's gonna happen? Hypertonic solution, what's gonna happen? The water is going to go out of the cell, the red blood cell. It's going to go towards the salt if there's if it's too high concentration in the extracellular fluid. Like if I went to Popeye's and had too much, you know, salt in my um, intercell extracellular fluid. And in this case, if it gets out of control, the sh cell will shrink, and you can't carry oxygen in a cell like that. And they call that crenation. So if you want to memorize this, fine. Like if you want to say, okay, isotonic solution, nice shape equilibrium, you know, you have equal amounts of salt, solute outside and inside, equal amount of water inside and outside. Hypertonic is gonna cause the cell to shrink because the water is gonna leave the cell towards the solute, which is on the outside. So if the solution solvent is hypertonic. Hypertonic means there's a lot of solute in the water. And don't forget, there's a membrane outside every cell. So it's the movement of water across that semi-permeable membrane. Hypotonic would be the opposite where the inside of the cell, now this is not organelles, this is salts or sugars even, you can even use sugar. So in this case, the outside of the cell is less tonic. It's more water than it is solute. That rushes in. That all rushes in through the membrane. Then the cell blows up and bursts and all the water comes out. And bursting is called lysing. So again, you can memorize, okay, hypertonic, he said, the shell is the hypertonic solution. The cell is going to shrink and cre crenate like this. And you'll see a picture coming up. Now, if the outside is hypotonic, then all the fluid is going to go inside the cell. And the cell is going to swell and it's going to burst. And that's lysing, hydrolysis, or is, you know, water bursting. So again, you don't have to know these numbers or anything like that, but the solute is the sodium chloride and the sol solution is the water, right? So don't worry about osmolarity and all that. We had enough chemistry for one lifetime. So here it is. Here's the picture. It's on the exam. I'm gonna put this right on the exam. And I'm gonna say, it. You know, of course, without the, the text up here. So look at the shape of this red blood cell. And the black is actually the solution. And don't forget this blood cell has a membrane that's selectively permeable, biphospholipid layer, fluid mosaic kind of, but the red blood cell really, it's just a life raft for oxygen, but it has a membrane. It doesn't have a nucleus, but it has a nice membrane. So in this case, the water is flowing in and out equally forming a nice isotonic solution. And it has a nice isotonic solution. So the solute on the in, outside of the cell and inside the cell it's basically the same osmolarity or the same concentration for our purposes. Shoo, right? Now, if there's a lot of solute like sugar or salt outside the cell, then of course the, and there's less inside the cell, the fluid is gonna come out. 
and the cell's gonna shrink. And that's called crenation. Now this is the opposite where you have a hypotonic solution where most of the solute is on the inside of the cell compared to the outside. Don't forget about the membrane. So now all the fluid is gonna rush into the cell and it's gonna swell and ultimately, watch this one's going to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's gonna lice. And you can't carry oxygen on, on a cell that looks like this. You can't carry oxygen on a cell that looks like this. This is what you want. It's an isotonic solution inside and out between a semi-selectively permeable membrane. Okay? You guys okay? You all with me? Anthony's you with me? Ready to take a break? We're ready for a break. <laughs> I'm with low blood pressure. <laughs> I can go on all night. Just uh, yeah, yeah. is like this get out of here. Well, what's up? Yes, please. I need a break. Wait, I have a question. All right, what's up? For the hypertonic and the hypotonic, I know there's names for it. Do we have to know them? What do you mean the names? The crenation part? Yeah, like the crenation. Yeah, you have to know that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a biology class, man. Okay, but I forgot it from Ken. No, no, I know it's repetition. You, you, you'll, you might get it now, but you walk out of here, you know, just like I said in lab, you'll be lost. So you got to keep going over this. I gotta, and I'm going to give you some practice questions and a little quiz this week to keep you on your toes. And there's not a lot on this exam, although we, you know, we have almost three chapters. So let's get it done. So we don't have, because the muscle is really the intense thing, the next big intense thing. All right. So we'll be back at, uh, 8.30, okay? Yeah. I'll try to get you out early, I promise. I will get you out early. I'm with low blood pressure. <laughs> yeah, no, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's like, uh, yay, three-hour class. Wow. All right, I'll see you at 8.30. Wonderful. Have a good break, Emily. Thank you.